Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. Welcome back to Biochemistry on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to talk about the mechanism of action of the endocannabinoids. So in the previous video, we talked about their biosynthesis, and we saw that they're actually both made from specific phospholipids in the plasma membrane. And what I want to emphasize here, again, before we go to the next slide and look at the mechanism, is remember this committed step in endocannabinoid synthesis. This is NaCl transferase. Once you catalyze this reaction and form n arachidonyl phosphatidylethanolamine or NAEP, this molecule doesn't really do anything else. So it's committed to forming these two endocannabinoids. So if you want to turn on that synthesis, just turn on this enzyme. And I talked about that at the end of the last video. The major thing that's going to activate this enzyme is elevated levels of calcium in that neuron. Okay, so if calcium starts influxing for some reason, you're going to get more and more activation of NaCl transferase. And that becomes important because it's, these endocannabinoids are going to serve as a negative feedback mechanism to kind of taper off the amount of neurotransmitter release so that we don't get excitotoxicity uh, within the central nervous system. Okay, So understand on the next slide that when we start activating NaCl transferase, I don't have that shown, but it will in turn just by nature of Le Chatelier's principle, more or less, it'll start activating these other enzymes, okay? Because there's only one direction these can go. So if you get more NAEP, you're gonna have activity of all of these. Well, let's now take a look at the mechanism and our basic setup here of our synapse. So up here at the top, we have our presynaptic neuron. This is the axon terminal. So this right here would be the presynaptic membrane. Down here, we have the postsynaptic neuron. Here's the postsynaptic membrane, okay? Now, remember that at this axon at the top, we're having an action potential travel down it. That action potential is going to activate this voltage-gated calcium channel, and calcium is going to influx from the synapse, or just some part of the extracellular fluid, into the cytoplasm. And remember, this calcium will cause this vesicle to exocytose. Now, remember the vesicle contains some neurotransmitter. We're just going to call that neurotransmitter NT, just to be generic. So that vesicle is going to exocytose, and when we get calcium influx up here, and that's going to cause the release of neurotransmitter into the synapse. And then, of course, that neurotransmitter is going to bind to its receptor on the postsynaptic membrane. Okay? And let's say that this receptor, uh, when it has bound neurotransmitter, it causes the activation of this calcium channel. And so now calcium will influx into the cytoplasm of the postsynaptic neuron. Okay. That's just a basic review of our physiology. But one thing I want to emphasize is up here at the postsynaptic membrane, if we have more calcium influx, we're going to have more vesicular exocytosis. That means more neurotransmitter, and that means more activation of this calcium channel. Okay, So we don't want that getting out of control. So we want to have a way of tapering the amount of neurotransmitter that's released by the presynaptic neuron. And the way that occurs is through the biosynthetic pathway that we just talked about. Now here I've got a couple of enzymes shown. The first one is phospholipase D. Recall that phospholipase D results in the formation of anandamide. And then down here we have diacylglycerol lipase. This one more specifically results in the formation of 2 arachidonyl glycerol, 2-AG. Okay? So back here, neurotransmitter activates this receptor. We now have calcium influx. So we're getting a lot of calcium um, into the cytoplasm of this postsynaptic neuron. Now remember, calcium activates uh, the committed step for endocannabinoid synthesis, which is NaCl transferase. I don't have that enzyme shown here, but again, if that enzyme becomes activated by this calcium, we're going to start having these enzymes catalyze their specific reactions. So for example, Phospholipase D catalyzes the conversion of NAEP into AEA. This is another term for anandamide, recall, because anandamide is really just arachidonyl ethanolamine, AEA. Now, this reaction uh, forms AEA really in that postsynaptic cytoplasm, but this is a hydrophobic compound, so it can just diffuse out here into the synapse passively. 
The second enzyme here that I have shown is diacylglycerol lipase. This converts DAG or diacylglycerol into 2-AG or 2 arachidonyl glycerol. Again, this molecule is going to be hydrophobic, so it can diffuse passively from the cytoplasm here of the postsynaptic neuron into the synapse. And so in the end, we really form both anandamide and 2 arachidonyl glycerol. In the end, these are both endocannabinoids, and they're going to have affinity for cannabinoid receptors. So notice here, this receptor for the cannabinoids, the CB1 receptor, is actually in the membrane of the presynaptic neuron. So what you actually see here for the endocannabinoids is their major mechanism of action here is actually retrograde signaling. Okay? The vesicular release over here was anterograde signaling because it's going from pre to post. But these endocannabinoids are retrograde. They're going backwards from post to pre. Okay? So what's going to happen is these endocannabinoids are going to bind to this cannabinoid receptor. Okay? So they bind here. It could be either one. It doesn't have to be both. And when they bind to this receptor, it's going to activate G proteins. Now, this CB1 receptor on its cytoplasmic side is coupled to a couple G proteins. There's the stimulatory G protein, or GS, and the inhibitory protein, GI. And both of these components of the G protein have affinity for different proteins. Okay? This one in purple, this is our voltage-gated calcium channel. And this one in pink, as we're going to see in a minute, is actually a voltage-gated potassium channel. Now remember what calcium channels do. They depolarize the membrane. right? And potassium channels hyperpolarize the membrane. Well, remember what our overall goal here was. We want to taper the amount of neurotransmitter release. Well, the neurotransmitter was released in response to high levels of calcium. So how could we get the neurotransmitter release to decrease? Well, we could, number one, decrease the activity of this voltage-gated calcium channel, but we could also increase the activity of the voltage-gated potassium channel. So does it make sense why the particular G proteins go to these particular proteins? The G... So does it make sense why these particular G proteins go to these particular channels? The G protein that's stimulatory goes to the potassium channel because if we want to decrease vesicular exocytosis, we want to hyperpolarize this membrane. And causing potassium efflux will hyperpolarize it. Also, this inhibitory G protein will inhibit the calcium channel, and if we inhibit that, there's less calcium influx and less depolarization. So we can achieve this through two means, less depolarization, more hyperpolarization. Okay? And so that's what happens. So we no longer have a voltage-gated calcium channel activation, or at least we have less of it. We have more of this voltage-gated potassium channel activity, so potassium is now effluxing, and the net result here is hyperpolarization of the membrane, or at least less depolarization. And so what's going to happen there is you're going to get less vesicular exocytosis and less neurotransmitter in the synapse and less activity here of that uh, neurotransmitter receptor. Okay, so what do we see here? What we see is that these endocannabinoids in this context are actually functioning as a negative feedback regulation of neurotransmitter release. We don't necessarily need excessive exocytosis of these neurotransmitters here uh, because that can lead to problems. So endocannabinoids are a way of regulating that. Okay. So we're going to conclude the video here. This is the major retrograde mechanism of endocannabinoids. In the next video, we're going to pick up with their degradation. And then after that, we'll look at actually how they regulate tumor growth. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.